Um, let me get a sense of the audience. Uh, Maria says it's a fairly diverse group, so just raise your hands real quickly, it'll help me. How many uh, K to three teachers, kindergarten to third grade teachers? Okay, so quite a few, and some of these may overlap. How about special ed, special education at any level? Okay, uh, just reading, straight reading instructors, just what you do. Okay, so like I said, it might be overlap. English language, uh, EOL teachers? Okay, a few, good. Psychologist? Psychologist? Good, good psychologist. Uh, speech language, is that what you are, Dave? You're a psychologist? I didn't know that. Speech language pathologist? Any? any? One? Good, okay. Uh, parents? Any parents? Parents? Okay, I guess a lot of your parents, if you're not, even if you're teachers, right? Um, uh, 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 any professors? Any universities? Okay. Good, okay. Uh, administrators, principals, assistant principals, superintendents? Quite a few, good, okay. Uh, where's the Syracuse Letters Group and, and Bonnie? Where that I had? Oh, right up here in the front row, okay. Okay, no, no harassment, okay. <laughs> Anybody who I didn't call doing anything different? No? Oh. Instructional coaches, I never even thought about that. Yes, thank you. Okay, good, good. Well, everything I'm gonna present tonight is relevant to everyone. It may be a little bit different if you're a high school teacher or middle school or elementary teacher, but everything is going to be relevant to, to, to what, you, what you do. You do have a, a handout of some of the most important slides. Uh, there's, uh, I think, maybe about 20 of them, so you do have that, that handout. What I try to do is to pick out the ones that are most relevant to what we're going to, to, do, to do tonight. Uh, questions, I'll stop um, at certain points for, for questions. Uh, and there'll be time for questions at the end uh, also. Um, the simple view model, before we get started, the simple view model is, uh, if not the most well-researched model, an extraordinarily well-researched model. It's, uh, I don't know about, about you, Dave, but when I go to conferences, um, it's always fun to watch presentations on the simple view because for many, many, many years, what researchers were trying to do was disprove it because that's what researchers like to do. They like to prove things, but they also like to disprove things or falsify things. And this is a model that has been very well researched and is relevant to uh, all sorts of alphabetic languages, as, as you'll see. So as we go through tonight, keep that in mind. This model's been around for quite, quite some time. So what I'm gonna do is this. Here are my goals tonight. We'll see what happens. I'm gonna explain the origin of the simple view model look at the implications of the formula for the model. D times C, or decoding times comprehension, equals, equals reading. Put and clarify the roles of decoding and listening comprehension in reading and in reading disability. I'm gonna define the three types of reading disability, dyslexia, hyperlexia, and mixed or garden variety for readers. We're going to look at the expanded view of reading comprehension in the SVR model. And I get to talk about, hopefully I'll be able to get to it, a little bit of my own research and applying the simple view to second language uh, learners. Um, in my work, what I do is I look at United States high school students taking a foreign language in high school, just like you did when you were in 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th grade, or college, and applying the simple view model to read. For those of you who are in ELL, the model is, is similar, only it's reversed. You're trying, when you were in high school, you were trying to learn Spanish or French or German. Well, a lot of your students are trying to learn English. But the model and the research base are quite, uh, quite similar, as you'll, as you'll see. So here's the outline. We're gonna go through the simple view and talk about that. Then we'll talk about expanding the simple view. The simple view isn't as simplistic sometimes as, as it seems. Then we're going to apply the simple view to foreign and second language learning, and then end with a summary and some, some questions. So let's talk about the simple view. In 1986, the role of decoding in reading was very controversial. Was anybody around in reading then? Remember the great debate? Remember the reading wars? Uh, I always like to tell audiences, just for fun, that uh, I'm getting pretty old. And so far, there's only one good thing I've found about getting old, and that is when something happened a long time ago, you were there. <laughs> well, I was there. I was there. I remember the reading wars. Uh, and in some places, as you know, they're still going on. 
But the role of decoding in reading was very, very, very controversial at that time. And in large part, it was because learning to read was thought to be natural. Unknown words were uh, to be read from context, and you were supposed to get the meaning first, not the words first. And I won't, I won't, I won't uh, say the name of that theory. Everybody remembers what that theory was, so I won't, I won't go there. But that's why the role of decoding was quite controversial at, at that time. Lots of educators just maintain that decoding was just a byproduct of reading. It just kind of happened. Okay, we didn't really have to teach it. We don't really know how it happened. It just kind of, kind of happened. Well, along came Goff and Tumner in 1986, and they wrote a very small article. It's only about five or six pages called Reading and Reading Dis or Decoding and Reading Disability. And in it, they proposed the Simple View model. Since that time, as I said, the Simple View has garnered a great deal of empirical evidence. So you're going to have to do a little bit of math. Okay? It's not hard, though. What Goff and Tundra said was this, that reading equals the product of decoding and language or listening comprehension. So the formula is R equals D times C, or if you prefer, D times C equals, equals R. So you've got three variables there. And they can range from zero, nothing, to one, perfection. Now, just a reminder, the C in the formula is listening or linguistic or oral language, whichever you prefer, comprehension. The C is always linguistic or listening comprehension. Now, what they proposed was that decoding, or D, is necessary, but it's not sufficient for reading. Well, what they meant by it was just because you can decode words doesn't mean that you're reading. You're just decoding the words. Likewise, linguistic comprehension, or C, was necessary for reading, but it's not sufficient either. You had to have both to be a good reader. They introduced a lot of things that folks knew, but kind of reinforced some key facts about decoding. And as you know, the skilled decoder can, 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 can read words isolated words very quickly and very fluently. Back in the, back in the day, when I would do uh, an evaluation for my private practice and go to a school to present the results that parents would want you to do sometimes, I would be surrounded by a group of teachers and I would give the reading score on word identification tests like the Woodcock Johnson and they would look at me and say, well, how'd you get that score? And I would show them what they did. The kid read from a list of words, context-free. You know what they would say? That's not reading. That's not reading because there's no context. The skilled decoder, though, can decode those words quickly, accurately, silently. Being able to do that was fundamentally dependent, Goff and Tunber said, on what they called the orthographic cipher. You can call it phonics, if you will, letter sound correspondences. But knowledge of the cipher wasn't sufficient for decoding because you have all sorts of letters, patterns in English that don't do what they're supposed to do. If you can see, I know this may be a little bit hard to see in the back, but look at those four words right there. What happens to the EA sound in those four words? Each word has a different sound, doesn't it? So you have to have some very deep knowledge of the letter sound correspondence system in the English language. And Goff and Tummer maintained that the purest measure of decoding was the ability to read pseudo words. Take a moment, just read those to yourself. Okay. For an audience like this, they're pretty easy, aren't they? Okay. Uh, but if you're showing these to a poor decoder, they're very, very difficult. Very difficult. I, uh, was talking with uh, um, a lawyer the other day, because I do uh, disability reviews, who is a, the head lawyer for a little uh, small college where my children attended at the time. Oh, where my children attended. And he was saying that they're getting all of these students who claim they're dyslexic. 
And I told him, I said, you can, you can see if they're dyslexic. He looked at me, how can I do that? I said, I wrote down 10 pseudo words, just like this, from very easy, one syllable, two syllable, three syllable, four syllable. So I said, can you read these words? And 10 for 10, he was great, he was great. I said, when you have someone who says he or she is dyslexic, just ask them to read these words. And as a college student, if they can read eight of them, nine of them, they're pretty good, aren't they? They're pretty good. Not, not likely dyslexic, not likely dyslexic. So here's how we've depicted the Simple View in our letters program for some time. So those of you that don't like mathematical formulas, here's a picture, okay? So you can see decoding and the skills that contribute to decoding and listening and language comprehension and the skills that contribute to language comprehension. Okay. Notice that fluency goes to both. You have to be a fluent decoder and you also have to be fluent at language comprehension. So what are some of the implications of this model? I've got them numbered, I'm gonna go through a few of them. The first one is this, is that proponents of decoding concede that if there's little or no ling linguistic or listening comprehension, then reading is not really taking place. You can decode, but you can't really comprehend. And so the fact that someone can decode words doesn't necessarily make them a reader. It's consistent with what the simple view model would, would predict. You need both to be a good reader. So decoding is sufficient, is, I'm sorry, not sufficient, but comprehension is also necessary. At the same time, the converse holds true as well. Comprehension is not sufficient, decoding is also necessary. Now think about this, when you're thinking about listening comprehension and language comprehension. Knowing a language isn't sufficient to make one literate. Think of a five-year-old who comes into your kindergarten class. They've been comprehending language for some time, haven't they? But what can't they do? can't decode. They can't really read, can they? But you tell them to sit down or do this or do that and they can comprehend just fine. So knowing a language, listening and comprehending a language isn't sufficient to make one a good reader. So they've been doing this for several years but still can't read. So if D times C, if, I'm sorry, if R equals D times C and D equals zero, then R is going to be zero no matter if their listening comprehension is perfect or not. Now, think of, start thinking about other implications. We're going to get into these as we go through the presentation. One of them is, well, what about fluency? How does that fit in? We're going to talk about that a little bit. Look at comprehension. And here, this model looks pretty simple, doesn't it? Well, we're going to talk about how it's a little more complex than, than this. And some of the newer research is bearing out some, some of this. Now what's the third implication? This is where the simple view model helped me tremendously, not just in my teaching, but in assessment, in teaching assessment and doing assessment in, in, in the office. The simple view model clearly maintains that reading ability should be predictable from a measure of pseudo word decoding and a measure of listening comprehension. R equals D times, times C. And there's abundant evidence in the literature that decoding and linguistic comprehension make separate and independent contributions to reading ability. I'll talk about that in, in a bit. By the way, as I go, th uh, go through, I've listed some of the references. Here's a couple right here. Uh, if you want any of these references or if I have them in my uh, computer and can send them to you, send the PDF to you, I'm happy to, happy to do that. So feel free to, to ask, um, af ask afterwards. But I tried to list some of the more recent research showing that, that the decoding and comprehension make separate independent contributions to reading ability. So it's very useful for the assessment of, of reading skills. Likewise, and a lot of you already know this, is that there's abundant evidence out there in the literature that word decoding explains the largest amount of the variance in explaining the acquisition of reading in the early grades 
and the variance in children's reading comprehension skills in the early grades. Decoding is extraordinarily important in order to be able to explain how kids learn to read. But as the child learns to decode words, listening comprehension begins to explain more and more and more variance in reading comprehension skill. Decoding is strong at the beginning in the early grades. Listening comprehension and the skills there begins to be a more accurate or higher, better predictor of comprehension. And that shift usually occurs according to the Language and Reading Research Consortium and some newer research around that third or fourth grade. Those of you who are a third, fourth grade teacher know that you begin to see that shift as long as a child can decode. Then listening comprehension, vocabulary, and the things that make up that skill begin to kind of take over. Now, here's one of the, I think, the best things about the simple view. A fourth implication is in Goff and Tunner's article back in 1986, they made the prediction that there would be subtypes of reading disability. So there are four kinds of readers according to the simple view, four kinds of readers, three of which are poor readers. Since good reader, good reading, I'm sorry, can only result from decoding and comprehension, there could be different kinds of reading problems. Inability to, oops, what happened? There we go. Inability to decode, inability to comprehend, or both. Inability to decode and inability to comprehend. Goff and Tunber called the inability to decode dyslexia. They labeled the inability to comprehend hyperlexia. And the inability to decode, and that should say, by the way, I just noticed that in the slide a little while ago, inability to decode and comprehend, not or comprehend, and comprehend. They called it the garden variety reader, which has come to be more uh, the mixed reader, mixed poor reader. Now let's talk about each one a little bit, and then we'll show you how it works in assessment and then in instruction. With dyslexia, the common denominator in every case of dyslexia is the inability to decode. That's the common denominator in a poor reader who is labeled as dyslexic. Every dyslexic is a poor decoder, but they have good oral language comprehension. Not perfect oral language comprehension, good oral language or listening comprehension. Even as far back as 1979 with Frank Bellatino and a lot of other researchers looking at kids who were poor readers in the fourth grade, the fifth grade, the sixth grade, found that kids at, those le at that level didn't know the simplest letter sound correspondences. So this research has been with us for some time. And what are the reasons they lack decoding skill according to the simple view of reading? And that would be because they have difficulties with phonological phoneme awareness and phonics or letter sound correspondences. So that was the first type of poor reader. So if you go back to the simple view, kids who were dyslexic had the inability to decode, and that's where their deficit was. But they were good with listening comprehension. Then there was the second type of poor reader. They called this, this reader hyperlexic. The hyperlexic reader had good decoding skills and poor listening or oral language comprehension. Now, I want to just pause for a second here. In the simple view, the term hyperlexia is used with less specificity than you often see it in the research literature. And there may be someone who has had some experience with a, a hyperlexic kid. Um, I ran into my first hyperlexic kid, oh gosh, 1990. And a parent brought in uh, a second grade child. And the child had a lot of clear, not articulation, but language difficulties. Had difficulty uh, following some just simple instructions. You could tell vocabulary was very poor. So I gave the child the first test was the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test. Some of you know that. And I didn't have to look up the score to know that this was going to be not a good score. And he ended up scoring at about the first percentile or second percentile. Then I pulled out the Woodcock Reading Mastery Test and went to the Word Identification Subtest. 
this little seven-year-old kid whose PPVT was first or second percentile is reading words like mystical, mathematician, geography. Oh no. It's one of those things, if, if, you, if you're old like I am, remember Candid Camera? I thought I was on Candid Camera because I, I'm sure my jaw dropped down to my, to my chest. Well, it turns out that there are kids, and you may have run into them before, who learn very, very, very early to decode words. They acquire word reading skill almost as if by magic prior to the age of five. But these same kids have extraordinary, who have extraordinary decoding skill have very low or lower IQs. I did several studies with hyperlexic kids and they're very hard to find. The IQs with those, with those children range from about 40 to 70, but yet their decoding skill was, was far, far superior. And they had significant deficits in listening and oral language comprehension. So Goff and Tunmer were using this term just to describe a type of reader who decodes well but has difficulty with listening comprehension. They're not those true hyperlexic kids that have those, those deficits there. So if you take the simple view, the problem with, the, with hyperlexic kids is in listening or language comprehension. Okay. Now, we go to the garden variety, or if you prefer, mixed type of poor reader. Here, this particular type of reader has both poor decoding accompanied by poor oral language comprehension. And this tends to be the majority of poor readers that, that we see. But it's important to remember as you're thinking about this that the existence of dyslexia and hyperlexia show that skills in listening comprehension do not necessarily have to be accompanied by skills in decoding. You can also have kids who are good at one and not good at the other. But in the mixed poor reader, they have poor difficulties with both. Okay. So, with the garden variety or mixed poor reader, their deficits are in decoding, their deficits are in language comprehension. So, both components of the simple view are problematic. Okay. Now, I like this chart because it kind of gives an overview of what we just did, okay? So here, here's what you have. You have the four types of poor readers. Let me get my clicker in this hand, see if I can do this. Can you see the red dot? Okay, so we have the four types of readers, including the good. Decoding times language or listening comprehension equals reading, okay? So the good reader, has good decoding, good listening comprehension. One times one equals one. I told you you had to do a little bit of math. Okay. The mix, poor decoding, poor listening or language comprehension, zero times zero, zero. The hyperlexic kid, good decoding, poor listening or language comprehension, one times zero, zero. And then the dyslexic, just the opposite. Zero times one equals zero. Now, I always like to just point out very quickly, zero is intended to show nothing. They don't have those skills at all. One, perfect. But that's not the way kids are, as you well know. So I've just kind of made one up, okay? Using other numbers. So let's take the good reader. He's good at decoding, isn't he? But he's not perfect, 0.8. Good at listening comprehension, but not perfect, 0.9. 0.8 times 0.9, 0.72. Does that make sense? Okay. You can see the garden variety, 0.2 times 0.2. But the interesting ones are the hyperlexic and the dyslexic. Look at the hyperlexic. Wonderful decoding, absolutely wonderful, but very poor listening comprehension. And then the dyslexic, just the opposite. Okay, does that make sense to, to everybody? Okay. So testing the theory. When we test the theory, what happens? Well, the simple view takes the position that decoding and listening comprehension are both essential to read. But think about this. Are there individuals who can 
decode and comprehend language but not read well? Are there kids who can decode but not comprehend language and still read well? And then are there kids who could neither decode nor comprehend but they still read well? One of the things I always ask folks to think about when I'm doing letters and presenting this is this. All of you have kids in your classroom who have been diagnosed with a smorgasbord of initials. ADHD, ODD, OCD, XYZ, GHI, right? All sorts of things. The question is, do those kids fit into the four types of readers that we've talked about, talked about here? And the evidence suggests that yes, a kid who has ADHD could be any one of those four types of readers. A kid who is oppositional defiant, has terrible behavior problems, could be one of these four types of readers. They may be able to read well, they just won't do it. He can, but he, but he won't. All of us have had those kinds of, of kids. The existence of those individuals would falsify the simple view of, of reading. So think about that a little bit. When we get to the question part, if you have a, a, a thought about this, feel free to, to, to ask. Now, let's go to the fifth implication. What about reading intervention? Well, the simple view clearly asserts that, the read, that reading skills will only improve by improving the weak skill. The reading skills don't improve by accommodating the weak skill. They improve by working on the weak skill and increasing it. So the model shows exactly where to target your intervention for improving the skills of the four of the three kinds of, of readers. So let's take a look at that slide we just looked at a moment ago. Look at the garden variety or the mixed poor reader. Which skills would the simple view assert need to be improved? All of them. Decoding and comprehension. For the hyperlexic reader, which skill or skills need to be improved? Listening comprehension, language comprehension. And for the dyslexic, decoding, decoding. So the simple view is pretty clear about that. Reading improves by improvement in the skills that are causing the reading problems or the reading disability. Now, what about reading instruction? Well, all of us know that we should address both components or all components in a good reading program. Multi-component programs tend to get better results than single uh, component programs. But there are some students, as uh, Aaron, Yoshi, and others have maintained, that do benefit from a specific emphasis on the weak skill in their, um, in their program. The decision should be based on your data, and if you're uh, a school psychologist or someone who does the testing, the decision of where to target your intervention is gonna be based on the results of, of your testing. So what I like to do when Parents, when they bring a, a child in to see someone like me, it could be a first grade child, it could be a fourth grade child. They want to know why is the child having reading problems and what to do about it. But parents are skeptical because lots of people have often tried lots of things. And what they want to know is, is where should this tar the instruction be targeted? So what I try to do when parents come in is exactly this. I'll test the child, decoding, listening comprehension, phonological awareness, letter sound relationships, vocabulary, as we'll talk about background knowledge, listening comprehension. So I can show the parents that you might have a child who's very weak in decoding, very strong in listening comprehension. And the parents generally know that because the child doesn't have multiple to any, really any difficulties with, with listening comprehension, language, verbal memory, but they can't decode the words. And that's what's holding them back from doing well in school. So let's pause here and talk about this a bit, and you could ask a couple of questions if you, if you have them. So why is this model helpful, helpful, in my view, for teachers? So take a minute, I don't know if everybody knows each other or not, so take a minute, turn to your neighbor, and 
talk to her or him and answer this question. Why is this model helpful, in particular, for teachers? Go ahead, talk for a couple minutes. What I'm going to do, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the easy answers. And then Doreen has a microphone. If you have another one, raise your hand. She'll come around, and you can give your answer to the question. Mine are pretty simple. Why is this model helpful for teachers? Well, oh, I forgot. Did you tape? Oh, no. There we go. Why is this model helpful for teachers? Well, I'm going to give you the easy answers. The first one is, it's simple. It's simple. And, as you'll see in a few minutes, it's evidence-based. That's the nice thing about it. Second, it identifies the locus of the student's reading problems. It says, this is where the problem is. And third, it tells the teacher where to target her instruction. There are kids who, be who benefit if they have decoding issues, who, who benefit, as you well know, from targeted problem or targeted methodologies or, or interventions in decoding. So, what are some other advantages? Raise your hand. And Doreen will come around and you can say. Don't everybody talk at once, okay? I can't hear you. Who has one? What's another advantage that you see from this model? Go for it. Here, guys, she has a microphone. It's hard to refute. Very well said. And why? Why is it hard to refute? Because it's so simple. Ah. <laughs> the simpler, the better. Simpler, the better. Okay, it's hard to refute. And you'll see again, when we talk about the evidence, it is even harder to refute. Who else? What else? Right. So it helps us to talk to parents um, about what the problem is, and to also fellow teachers, um, the staff in the school, so we can better explain what we're looking at when we're looking at children, and we don't have to talk in generality so much. So awesome. that would be very helpful. Very I good. Think, very good. Helps you to talk to parents. And, and I think with me in the office, the simple view and the kind of testing that we do, it does make my job very easy to talk with parents. It does, you're right. You're right, that's a good one. Anybody else? This, oh, go, there you go. It illustrates how you have to focus on the deficit area to improve, and just continue to focus on the strength area okay. won't get it done. Yeah. We don't stop teaching the strength area, but you're right. Focusing exclusively on that's not going to get it done. Good. Well said. Well said. This side of the room, you're letting everybody down. Come on. Somebody over here? Anybody? No? Okay. Okay, good. Oh, here, wait, here we go. Here we go. One more. One more. No, no, go for it. Go for it. Um, I think it illustrates a hierarchy of how all the components of reading fit together, and it's easily explainable as well. So we have to have all pieces of that puzzle together in order for it to be successful. Very good. Very well said. Nice job. Was somebody else? Yes. She's got it right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She was just saying looking at fewer variables helps us to what understand uh, what to uh, not only what reading is and what it's not, but but what what to do, what to do. Good, very good. Well said, everybody. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, where? It's empowering for kids to to know what oh. their weaknesses are. Oh, there you are. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go go ahead one more time. I'm, I'm looking around. Go ahead. In addition to explaining it to parents, it's helpful for kids to know why they're struggling. It's okay. empowering for them. Yeah, let them know. Good. Well said. Good answers, everyone. Excellent. 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 Now, what's some support? We were talking about evidence-based a moment ago. What's some support for the SVR model? Well, we've had lots and lots of studies. I've just put a few of, more of the more recent studies up here, but there's many, 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 many others. Numerous studies have supported the premises of the model with English-speaking learners in the United States. Researchers have also found that decoding and listening comprehension make separate and independent contributions to reading uh, skill, to reading comprehension. Hence, you can have a kid 
who doesn't decode well but has good listening comprehension or vice versa. And the skills, when we, when we Maria had asked me when, when I talked about separate and independent contributions, what does that mean? What it means is that the skills that predict decoding are not directly related to listening comprehension. They help you to comprehend when you read, but they're not directly related to those skills. So if we think about this for a second, hopefully this will, this will make sense. If you look at decoding, the skills that predict decoding, phonemic awareness, phonics, or pseudo-word decoding, are not the skills that predict listening comprehension. You can have very good pseudo-word decoding skill, very good phonological awareness skill, but still be poor in listening comprehension. Those are the skills that predict decoding. Language comprehension, you have other skills that predict language comprehension. I always ask kindergarten and first grade teachers to think about that little kid who comes in and within a very short period of time, well, you can tell he or she just has a marvelous spoken vocabulary, just phenomenal. And you start working with them and they have very poor phonological awareness, trouble learning letter sound correspondences, hence trouble with decoding. So the point is, is that they make separate and independent contributions to reading and you need decoding, you need listening or language comprehension to be a good reader. Now, what are some other studies that support the SVR model? Well, this model has been tested in different languages. I've just listed a few of them here, um, more, more recent ones, Norwegian, Swedish, French, Hebrew, Dutch, all of these different kinds of languages have tested the simple view and found that it predicts reading just like it does in, in English. And other studies have found that the model explains reading development in English language learners, in ELL children. And that is that both listening comprehension and decoding make separate and independent contributions to English reading. Studies with language minority children have found exactly the same thing that we find in all of these other studies. There's a wonderful study that just came out by Kim that, that really illustrates this very, 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 very well. And other studies, another study that just came out recently too, other studies have found that listening or oral language comprehension is the most powerful predictor of reading comprehension as children get older. Now, what are some challenges to the SVR model, to the simple view model? And there have been some. Some researchers have hypothesized that as text reading becomes increasingly demanding that even good word decoding and good listening comprehension may not allow for really good reading comprehension. One hypothesis has been this, and this is re research has been going on for some time. One hypothesis is, is that fluency might be a separate component or explain unique variants all by itself in reading comprehension. So instead of the, form oops, instead of the formula being D times C, some people have, hypo have hypothesized that it's D times C times F fluency equals reading. And the research on this is really kind of equivocal. There have been studies that have, been sh have shown that fluency can explain unique variants in reading that can't be explained by decoding and listening comprehension. And then there have been other studies which show no, that, that, that's not. So this is still kind of an open, open question and people are still doing research on, on this. Another challenge has come from um, Tunmer, who was one of the original folks looking at the simple view, and his colleague Chapman. And they've hypothesized that word decoding and language comprehension do indeed make separate and independent contributions, but that vocabulary itself may make an independent contribution to reading ability or to reading comprehension. And their findings have, have shown that although the model D times C remains intact, that vocabulary in their work has made an independent contribution to, um, um, to reading and language comprehension. This was true, I won't get to it in, in mine, but this is true in, in a couple of studies that we have done where in looking at high school students in the US taking Spanish, that decoding and comprehension 
uh, took up uh, listening comprehension, took up almost all the variants in reading comprehension, but that vocabulary by itself explained about 3% of the variants in reading comprehension, all by all by itself. Not a lot, but enough to explain a little bit more about how well kids comprehend. And so here again, the research is kind of equivocal on this, but it is a challenge to the model. Is vocabulary and is fluency going to make separate and independent predictions? So this may be a good point right here before we go into the next section. Does anyone have a particular question that you'd like to, to ask? And we can bring around the, around the microphone if you'd, if you'd like. Something you don't understand or just want to ask a little more in depth besides what I did here? So, in the back there. I just had a question about uh, your um, findings about short hyperbole to dyslexia. You said that the IQ is typically very low or has to be very low. Yes, has to be. In my studies, I've, I, these kids are, I've seen in 35, almost 40 years, I've seen nine of these kids. That's how rare they are, nine. Other people may have seen, seen more. The, kid, the age range, I'm sorry, the IQ ranges of the kids in my studies were 40 to 80. And I had one kid that I, I um, tested and tried to include him in a study in, in one of my papers on hyperlexia and the individual had an IQ of 95, had to throw them out because it wasn't, it didn't meet that criteria. So is that, yeah. Anyone else want to ask? Oh, there we go. Yes. Well, there's this, I, I, I kid, but there is another type of, of reading disability, and of course that's, uh, some people will jokingly call it uh, either non teaching meaning the child hasn't been taught, or if the child's been in school for a while but hasn't been taught, they'll call it dis as you as you know. Uh, but yes, we differentiate because I'm not going to diagnose a child as um, dyslexic if I find out that they haven't been um, uh, taught letters. They haven't been uh, you know, taught to write their name. They're coming into first grade. I, when I travel around the country, I, I'm in some states that don't have um, mandatory kindergarten. So if you're a first grade teacher, you could have half your class that went through kindergarten half day or full day all year, and half your class that's their first day of school ever. And of course, it drives the teacher nuts. Uh, because she has some kids who know all of the letters, sounds, write their name, read words, and nothing. Well, of course, those kids who have not even been in school, immediately they, they want to label them. And you can't, you can't do that. You have to try to teach them first. Is that, is that what you're asking? Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. Anyone else have a, have a question? There you go, right there. Wait. When you mention language comprehension, are you looking at simply receptive vocabulary? No, listening comprehension. Receptive vocabulary can be a part of that. But listening comprehension uh, is being able to understand uh, uh, discourse uh, between two individuals or reading to you. Yeah. So vocabulary is a part of that because your listening comprehension could be low because you have a poor vocabulary or it could be high because you have a good vocabulary. Am I answering or, or not? You sure? Okay. Anyone else? Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, did you have one? Go ahead. Go ahead. We have sometimes, as teachers, it's difficult because there are students that really struggle in decoding, and then there's ways that we have to report as far as comprehension that they are not performing on grade level because they're not decoding to read on grade level. Yeah. So what do you recommend to do in those situations? Well, wait a minute. Ask me again. I miss, I miss something. They're having trouble with decoding. Like students who are below level in decoding. Yes. Reading a text. Um, 
sometimes we're being forced to report that they're not oh, 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 okay. I, I missed the forced, I missed the forced to read yeah. part, yes. Well, well, right. well, I can only tell you, I'll tell you what the simple view would say. The simple view would say, if you have a child who is indeed a poor decoder, and that's been identified as the um, uh, primary difficulty, the, the poor component of reading, but yet you know for whatever reason that listening comprehension is strong, the simple view would assert that if you want to improve the child's reading, you're going, even if he's being, quote, forced to read text that, you know, he can't read, someone is going to have to work on the decoding to improve that skill so that eventually he can read that text that he's being, quote, forced to read. Am I, am I responding? Is that, I don't want to, it's kind of a separate, like, tricky situation, just as much yeah. reporting purposes. Yeah, but that, yeah, that's, yeah. Coming from because yeah. it's not giving always an accurate picture to the parents. Yes. That yes. Because they're looking and saying, oh my gosh, they're below and have everything. Right. Where that is not necessarily that not necessarily true, right? Right. You're saying they are stuck. Yeah. The simple view would, would suggest that it's the decoding issue that would need to be um, um, remediated. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on to expanding the simple view of reading. Um, David, I don't know if you were at when we were at SSSR last year in Halifax. I don't know if you were at UCAT's uh, session where he's doing a presentation, he's one of the foremost researchers in the simple view, and he got up, and his first uh, um, session, or first thing that he said was, I am so tired of talking about the simple view of reading. Well, that's not quite what he meant, okay. What, he's, what he was saying was this. He's saying that we've made the simple view, we may have made the simple view too simple. And there's lots of new research beginning to come out which is suggesting that one part of the simple view may not be as simplistic as we think it is. So researchers are beginning to look at, Katz is one of them, Kim and some others are beginning to look at it, and they're beginning to suggest that the simple view may not be as simplistic as we've presented it. Because the simple view, as you can see by looking at the model and listening to what I've presented here, is suggesting that decoding and listening comprehension are equal in complexity and in their malleability, their ability to teach. And these researchers are proposing that the simple view may have been made too simple because language comprehension, the C part of it, is more complex than perhaps we've, we've thought. And so they're beginning, beginning to look at this. Well, we know that poor comprehenders generally display oral language difficulties. There's abundant research to, to support that. However, poor comprehenders' difficulty uh, with comprehension goes beyond oral language and listening comprehension is what is being, being proposed. For example, if you follow this topic, you've probably read that researchers have found that poor comprehenders have difficulties with working memory, with inferencing, they lack background knowledge, other things that contribute to listening comprehension. And, but the simple view model doesn't explicitly specify those subcomponents, does it? When you looked at that model, D times C, and what predicts decoding, what predicts comprehension, you don't see background knowledge in there, you don't see working memory in there, you don't see inferencing, inferencing in, in there. We already know that vocabulary makes an independent contribution, so we've got that in there. So what researchers are suggesting is perhaps the comprehension part of the simple view may not be as simplistic as we thought it is. So what they've been working on is identifying those subcomponents of language and listening comprehension. Uh, there's a lot of work coming out of of the Language and Research, Reading Research Consortium uh, that has been doing some of this work and others are doing uh, lots of other work. And so they've been looking at what we talked about a moment ago, fluency and vocabulary. But more research is necessary, they're saying, because reading comprehension uh, is not unidimensional. It's not just one dimensional. Instead, it has lots of components. It's multidimensional. So, Let's take a look 
at some models of this and what people are proposing. The first one has been around for some time. And I was talking with someone, who was it? Oh, there, that's it. She's going to get up and explain it in just a moment, right? right? Yeah. Uh, is Scarborough's reading rope. You may have run into this in uh, uh, maybe Dr. Murray's class, who knows? Well, the rope, what it does is it depicts the components of both the coding and comprehension. And for the purposes of this, I'm going to focus on the, the comprehension piece. So in the reading rope, comprehension includes several subcomponents. Not just vocabulary, but also background knowledge. Now, background knowledge, I, when I teach letters mod 6, a big part of letters mod 6 is background knowledge. And lots of teachers will, I'll teach back, I'll say background knowledge and I'll get this, hmm, what do you mean by that? So what I tell them is get out their pencil, get out your pen, okay? I'm going to give you a very technical definition of background knowledge. You ready? Stuff. You know a lot of stuff, okay? I ask you, what's the capital of North Dakota? And you say what? Very good. What's the capital of Maine? Florida. Tell me one country, one country that's north of India. China, okay? And I could be asking, asking questions, and I do that in, 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 the, in, in the letters. I have about 20 terms picked out. And I say, if you, if you know this, and be honest, raise your hand, raise your hand if you know this term. And if I have an audience of, usually it's about 30 or 40, you'll have five people that know this one, but then another five people know this one, a totally different five people. But you just know stuff. And I remember, first time I remember that I was learning stuff was fourth grade. We had to memorize the 50 states and all their capitals. And that was in preparation for the fifth grade because in fifth grade, our fifth grade teacher was teaching this terrible subject called geography. Okay. Remember geography? And he gave us a map and he, of the United States. And he said, remember in fourth grade you learned about all the states? Well, there's a blank map here. The states are in it, right in every state and its capital. You're going, I just got off summer break. You want me to do this now? That's background knowledge. That's stuff. And it built from there. It built from there. Well, background knowledge is one of the subcomponents that allows us to be a good comprehender. Another one is knowing grammar, syntax, semantics. Another one is verbal reasoning, inferences, metaphors, and literacy knowledge, knowledge of certain types of genre, poetry, mysteries, fiction, nonfiction, etc. So if you're familiar with Scarborough's rope, looks like this. Now, you have that on your handout. It's one of the slides I put in there. I know the, the print's a little small, but hopefully you can make it out. But the language comprehension piece that I'm going to focus on is at the top here. And the point of the rope, you can probably look at it and get it. Okay? The point of the rope is that the strands in the rope and comprehension and the word recognition all start out as separate strands. And as children, are taught, practice, learn, those strands get tighter for both, and at some point they join to be able to comprehend, and as kids read more, talk more, learn more, then it becomes a very tightly woven rope. But if children don't master all of these subcomponents, then the rope remains frayed or loose, and they have difficulty with reading comprehension. Does that make sense to, to everybody? That's well, just one depiction. And so the point is, is that, oh, I'm sorry, is that at the bottom, reading is a multifaceted, multi-component skill that's acquired gradually over several years with lots and lots and lots of practice and really good, good teaching. Now, another one that been recently published by uh, Dr. Kim called the Situation Model. And this has been around for a while. She gave a nice picture of it, which I'm going to show you in her uh, recent paper. It's just a mental representation of what kids have to do to comprehend oral or written text. What she talks about are three different levels of mental representation that require different skills. So you see here, there's the surface, 
the lowest level, text space, and then the situation model, which is at the highest level. In her paper, she depicts it like this. The surface code are those foundational language and cognitive skills that you need for everything. Vocabulary, you don't just need vocabulary for reading, you need it for math, you need it for other things, you need it for science. Grammatical knowledge, you need grammar for all sorts of things. Working memory, you need it for everything. Attentional control, you need attention in everything. Those are those foundational skills that you need, not just for reading, but for everything. The text base are these higher order cognitive skills. Inferencing, we'll talk about theory of mind in just a second, and monitoring your comprehension as you read. And finally, the situation model ends with discourse comprehension and production. Now when I first saw this model, what I had to do is this. Because I had to get a, a picture of this somehow, okay? So I began to understand it a little bit. So let me just show you what I did to, to help me. Is I needed to put it in something like this, okay? So I needed to list those skills in a different, in a different way. So what I did is I put the lowest level here, the surface code. And I listed the skills that Dr. Kim had in her paper, those foundational skills that are needed for everything, not just for, for reading. The text base, those higher order uh, co uh, cognitive skills. So you have the ability to inference, which comes from your vocabulary and your background knowledge, et cetera. Theory of mind, that was a, one, that's a term I never heard before. And what she seems to mean by it is the ability to infer others' perspectives, to see something from someone else's point of, point of view, which is hard, very, very hard. And comprehension monitoring, when you read, you're evaluating the adequacy of your propositions. What, what, what are you, what are you, what's the author proposing, and what are you taking away from it? using your vocabulary, using your background knowledge. And if you do those things well, you end up being able to understand discourse and of course to write discourse, to have good reading comprehension and to be a good writer. So I haven't asked her if this is correct yet, I hope it is, but it's what it might take away from the model that she published in her paper. And what you can see from this is that comprehension is a lot more complex, isn't it? than what we think about it normally in the simple view. Here's one of her quotes from her paper. Word reading and listening comprehension are upper level skills that are built on multiple language and cognitive components. There's another way that she depicts this in another report that she's published. This comes from the landscape report that was published in 2016. And again, if you don't have that, I'm happy to, to, to send it to you, or I can send it to Dr. Murray. If you have an email list, you can, you can send it out. But she depicts this in a little bit different, in a different way. So down here are your foundational cognitive skills, your working memory, your attentional control. And then you have your emergent literacy skills here, print awareness, et cetera, which is the foundation for word reading your language and cognitive skills, your vocabulary, et cetera, foundation for listening comprehension. And those two form the foundation for reading fluency and reading comprehension. Just another way of depicting all of these skills that are important for comprehension, but showing you all of these subcomponents. Now, here's the simple view of reading again, okay? Now, the next slide, okay, it's only my picture of it. Like I said, I need a, a way to understand this to help me, so this is what I came up with. Here's the simple view of reading the way it's generally depicted, okay? Notice how simple comprehension is. It's pretty simple, isn't it? When you add all of those multi-components or sub-components in, it looks more like that. Surface code, all of those skills. Text base, all of those skills that we talked about, which eventually ends up in the ability to write and understand discourse. Okay, so just another way of looking at it. But this is a, a really fruitful area of research and I'm sure that when uh, we go to the um, Society for the Scientific Study of Reading Conference this summer, there'll be more research on it and it's gonna better develop this. 
So let's pause here for a moment and do what we did at the end of the other section. Is why are language comprehension and reading comprehension more difficult than you think? So turn to your neighbor, do what you did a few minutes ago, talk to your neighbor and answer this question. Why are reading and listening comprehension more difficult than you think? Go ahead. Reading comprehension more difficult than you think. What are some of the reasons? Just raise your hand and they'll bring around a, a microphone. What are some of the reasons? Here, here, I'll just, just use mine, here. Go ahead. We were discussing that um, you can teach lots of things. You can teach vocabulary. Mm -hmm. You can't make up for deficits in background knowledge mm -hmm. without providing experiences mm -hmm. to children. And so that birth to five is mm -hmm. vitally important in the construction of that mm -hmm. knowledge that they bring to school. And when you don't do that and mm -hmm. have that, all that other stuff is really hard to bring into play. Good point. But background knowledge, nice, very nice. Background knowledge is, it can be taught, obviously, but a lot of times you're playing catch-up, uh, a lot of catch-up. And so it's very difficult to um, put all of that, or stuff all of that knowledge in there. Yeah, good point. Well, why are reading and language comprehension more difficult than you think, based on what we've talked about here? I just give her mine. We were saying that we didn't think it was uh, simple to begin with. Uh, <laughs> that we've been teaching for a long time, that's not simple. That's right. But I, I really like when you brought up working memory and those other things because that's what we see, that's what we're working with, kids are working with. And um, so that really helped me to see a little bit more of what you're talking about and how I can work with these kids. Good point. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Who else? Who else? There you go. Yeah, I was kind of stuck at that comment in terms of I think the house structure really helps me visually to think about if those are the foundational cognitive skills and you have a student who's really struggling to attend uh, or to regulate and control, mm -hmm. then, then they already get very bottom level piece is okay. not solid for them. Yeah, exactly. The foundation is shaky. Yeah, good one. Very good. Who else? Who else? Here, right. Oh, she'll get it, and then we'll get you next. We all have loud voices. <laughs> <laughs> With the background knowledge that we bring, uh, we're all constructing different ideas and bring different ideas to this. So, going back to the mathematical model, I mean, this is 2.9, 0.8. Two people that are 0.72s may be so because of different reasons. There you go. So everyone's a little different in the room. Everyone's going to walk out here with a little bit of different knowledge constructed after listening tonight yeah. because of what we brought in and what we'll take and do with it at least. Excellent observation. Very good. You know what always, I understand it now, but when I was in, oh, in my 20s and 30s, there's the Supreme Court, right? There's nine votes. And they're supposed to be making their decisions based on the Constitution. And I always thought, if that's what they're doing, why is every vote nine to nothing? That's exactly why. They're reading it and understanding it in a different, in a different way. Yeah. Good one. Right. Here you go. I'll just. There you go. I don't like the measure, but looking at the labor of reporting the students on ADD, but we know that ADD, ADHD students can be all four types of readers. Mm -hmm. And I oftentimes when I'm in an intervention meeting or say that attention is always the issue, but when I look, that's not part of the formula. Right. And my other concern is that I'm really seeing a lot of students who are deep the decoding pieces in place, but the comprehension component isn't. And we quickly go to the auditory processing disorder. And right. I'm really concerned about that. Right. That you could agree about that. Right. We were we were talking uh, about the the notion of auditory processing and what I'll suggest, and if there's anybody else that wants to, to chime in, uh, the research shows that auditory processing is a, is a very problematic concept, a very problematic diagnosis. It's got a lot of, um, of um, difficulties. Um, and one of our colleagues has 
published a very nice paper on, on that in school psychology journals talking about all of the difficulties with that particular concept. So uh, that's, I'll, I'll leave it there with, uh, with auditory processing. What was your first part, I'm sorry, about? Oh, yeah. 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 It's really not performing. No. Yes. That's right. A child can really have ADHD and be a good reader, but can have ADHD and be one of the three types of poor readers. Yes. Yes. Who else? Anything? Anything else? Why are these things so so problematic? Let me tell you one of mine. One is really pretty simple. This comprehension isn't a unidimensional skill. It's a multidimensional skill. When you think of a child who has a comprehension issue, there's lots of things that it, that it could be. It's not just understanding language, there are other components that, that fit in there. So it's a really hard, hard skill. A second one is that it's often hard to distinguish in a poor reader which subcomponent is deficient. Is it the vocabulary? Is it the background knowledge? Is it, is it working? Is it working memory? The one thing that, that I can um, say clinically is that when I see poor comprehenders in the office, good decoders and poor comprehenders and who have that hyperlexic profile, what I always see with those kids, whether they're third grade, whether they're sixth grade, whether they're high school, is they have um, deficits in vocabulary and background knowledge. Those two things in particular. There could be other things too, but those two in particular always, always stand out. So it's very hard sometimes to distinguish which skill or which some component. And the third thing is this, is Hugh Katz and others are saying, this may be a, a, um, an area of research where we're just kind of getting started. We know a lot, but we may just be getting started on this. How do we teach comprehension? How do you teach comprehension, for example, to a kid with difficulties with comprehension monitoring? who has difficulties inferencing, who has difficulties with metaphors. How do you teach, teach that? There's a lot of, of work that needs to be done on, on this particular part of, of, of the simple view. Any further questions, comments on this part? Okay, so here's what we've done so far. Let's review. What we've done so far is we've gone through the simple view of reading. We've talked about what it is, some of the implications, the different types of, of readers, good and poor readers. And in the first part, we made it out to be pretty simple. In the second part, we said, well, it may be not quite as simple as we think it is, specifically in the area of language comprehension. It's a lot more uh, difficult, has a lot more components than perhaps we've thought. Now, let's go to the third part. The simple view of reading applied to foreign and second language learning. And again, for those of you who are English language ELL teachers, what you're gonna have to do, but you can do this, you're gonna have to take what you do and turn it around. I'm gonna be talking about students in the United States, high school students taking, in this case, Spanish, but could be French, could be German. And you have students who are perhaps native Spanish speakers and what they're trying to learn to read, write, speak, spell, comprehend is, is English. So you're gonna to have to take this research and, and turn it around. But what I would suggest to you is that the findings from these research studies and the implications are uh, quite similar to what you're facing and what you're gonna to have to do with your English language learners. So what I got interested in was this, is 30 years ago, we started encountering high school and college students who were average or better students who were really struggling with foreign languages in high school and college. Now, you have to understand one thing, neither I nor my colleague, Lenora Ganshaw, when we started this, we don't read a foreign language, we don't speak a foreign language, we don't spell a foreign language, we can't comprehend a foreign language, okay? I can do simple Spanish words and simple Spanish sentences, but that's about it. What we do is we research foreign languages, and when we need 
to test foreign languages, we have these wonderful colleagues, Spanish professors, French professors, who do that type of work, work for us. What we became interested in was why? Why are they having such difficulty? Because they're smart kids, right? We would see kids with these very high IQs who were having great difficulty, not, not necessarily failing, but great difficulty with, with Spanish or French or German. So we've been researching this for about 30 years. Recently, I started applying the simple view model to these students. Now, let's think about US students first, because there's a lot of contextual things that go in, into this. And there's some, they're, they're in some cases similar to some of the contextual things that your ELL students face, but, but again, there's some differences. In the United States, we're largely a monolingual society. Uh, how many, show of hands, how many of you in the room speak, comprehend, read, write a second language fluently? I rest my case. Three I saw, three? Yeah, three, okay. Now that wouldn't be true if we were sitting in, let's say, Germany or the Netherlands. I spoke at a conference in the Netherlands, oh gosh, many years ago, seven, seven, or, seven or eight years ago. I was the only person of all the presenters who spoke one language. And everybody else spoke two, three, four. There was one person who spoke eight different languages. It's different elsewhere. So one of the problems is that we live in a mono, largely monolingual society. There are areas of the country that you can go to that, that are um, more multilingual, um, but not many. The second, second thing is this, is that we don't start largely looking at foreign languages or studying foreign languages until high school. Now, that sounds pretty silly, but that's the way it is. There are some immersion programs for younger kids, but they're few and far between, they're not many. The other problem is that in the United States, we study foreign language as a subject. You have to pass two years of foreign language to do whatever, three years of foreign language to do whatever. It's not studied to become fluent or literate, it's studied to pass a course and get a credit and graduate. Uh, it's the rare student who takes it for, uh, to become literate or fluent. So there's a lot of differences here. Nonetheless, we can still study what happens with US learners trying to learn to read and comprehend another language. So in alphabetic languages, we've already talked about this, I won't, I won't uh, belabor it, is the simple view asserts that R equals D times C. You know what the simple view is, the, the, the assertions would be no different for those of us trying to learn Spanish or French or German in, in high school. So I've published several papers on this. If you're interested, I'm more than happy to send them to you. I've published about five or six papers on this in uh, foreign language journals, foreign language annals, Hispania. The study I'm talking about now is, was published in the Journal of Learning Disabilities earlier um, this year. How many US students, how many US high school students have a foreign language reading disability? And you probably know the answer to that, but I'll wait and surprise you at the end. Of, at the end. So, and then another one that we just have, have, uh, have coming out. So here's what we did. Okay, I'll go through the, the study fairly quickly. What we did is we had a random sample in one school district of United States high school students taking Spanish. There were 800 students. We randomly sampled. We had a little over 300. Okay? And we followed them through three years of Spanish, the ones who completed three years. So we followed them through first year, second year, third year. There are the numbers of students who complete. You notice what happened. Look at what happened. 268 of the 307 completed Spanish 2. Look what happened in Spanish 3. How many of you took three or four years of a language? Yeah, a lot of you, probably because you're teachers, right? <laughs> but most students don't. Most students don't. They take two years, get the credit, that's it. That's all they do. Half males, half females. We were in a suburban district, very large district with four high schools. We had about 75 from each of the high schools. They were all monolingual speakers, no, no other language no other language at home, no students on IEPs or 504s, no, no students with learning disabilities. They got Spanish every day, 180 days a year, five days a week, et cetera, okay? Now, what we did in the beginning of the study, when they were in the beginning of ninth grade, we tested all those skills. I won't read them off to you, you can, you can see them. But we wanted to get reading, I'm sorry, decoding, vocabulary, comprehension, short term phonological memory, working memory, et cetera. We also got a second language aptitude test. You may be familiar with the modern language aptitude test. 
We administered those at the beginning of Spanish one. Okay? Then we did something that no one has ever done. Anybody in here familiar with the Woodcock Munoz test? Okay. It's the Spanish equivalent of the Woodcock Johnson. And I didn't know it existed until about five years ago. And then I had to find a district that would let me come back and do another study, which I did. Now, I could administer the decoding piece. If you read Spanish words to me, I could tell you whether they're right or wrong. Right? That's about all I can do. Okay? I can't do much of, much of anything else, but I could do that part of the study. But here's what we, what we did. We tested their decoding, pseudo-word decoding, reading comprehension, vocabulary, listening comprehension, spelling, the writing in Spanish. That's what the Woodcock Munoz does. Okay? Now, what we did, the Woodcock Munoz, is really neat, because what we can do is we can take your ninth grade kid, okay, and we can compare him to ninth grade native Spanish speakers, eighth grade, seventh grade, all the way down to kindergarten, because we have norms for that. That's what standardized tests do. Okay? So we can compare your kid to any level of native Spanish speaker that we want to on the Woodcock Munoz. So why do we do that? People say, well, you can't do that. Well, of course you can. First, because the test allows you to do it. But comparison to, US, to other US students tells us nothing about how well you learn Spanish. I made an A in Spanish. By the end of the year, I probably had a total Spanish vocabulary of a couple hundred words. But I did better than you, and you did better than her, and she did better than her, OK? That doesn't tell us how well you learn Spanish if we compare you to other US learners. A grade of A just tells you that you did better than somebody else. That's all it tells you. It doesn't tell you anything else about how you did in Spanish. So when you took the national Spanish exam and you got the 95th percentile, your mom and dad thought, wow, you're going to be an interpreter at the UN. <laughs> no, you were compared to other US students, right? That doesn't tell us anything. It just tells us you're better than other US students. That's it. Now, some people will say it's not fair. Well, let's think about this. First, native speakers of other languages are routinely compared to US students in schools whose native language is English. So that little kid whose native language is Spanish, when he takes the third grade proficiency or whatever test you have here or the Terra Nova, that little kid is compared to native US speakers. Okay. Is that fair? The second is we can finally, if we do this, establish some func functional be benchmarks for US students finishing one year of Spanish in a monolingual country, two years of Spanish, you know, how, how much should you really do? How well should you really do? Right now, we don't know. We have no idea. And also, there have been no studies that have compared US students to native Spanish-speaking students on a standardized test. This is the first study of its type. So we use the simple view of reading model. There it is again. Keeps coming up. And the premises for foreign language, Spanish, are the same as they are for uh, a native English speaker learning to read English. Same exact types of considerations. What I was interested in was number three. Were there going to be different types of foreign language readers? Would there be native English readers taking Spanish who would be good at decoding and good at comprehension? Good at decoding, poor comprehension. Poor at decoding, good comprehension, or poor both. Does that make sense? Same four readers we've talked about so far. Okay. There's another way. I think. Did you give them that handout, Maria, with with this or not? Do you have that? Okay. It's the same. The same thing that uh, that you have. There are four different kinds of, of readers. I'm sorry. Got it. Okay. Good. Now what we had to do is we had to develop our criteria. Who's going to be a good reader? Who's going to be a, a, a dyslexic reader? We had to develop our criteria. Now, uh, school psychologists, if you know standard scores, you look at standard score of 85. I'm going to show you that in just a second if you don't understand standard scores. But we had to go down to 85, about the 15th percentile, uh, because uh, United States students don't do real well in Spanish. To find good readers, we had to go down to about the 15th percentile in Spanish. So that's what we did. OK. So for those of you that don't know standard scores, I'm going to show you a profile of what a good reader looks like. And again, this is true for what we've been talking about all evening. Okay? 
If you have a standard score, you probably know the mean is 100. The average range is right in the middle there in that large rectangle. So if you get scores between here, you're in the average range. If you get scores up here, oh, I'm sorry, you're in the above average range. And if you get scores down here, you're in the below average range. Does that make sense, everybody? Now, so what would a good reader look like if he or she is a good reader in Spanish? The coding would be in the average or above average range. Reading compre or sorry, language comprehension, average, above average range. Does that make sense? That's what a good reader looks like. A mixed reader, or garden variety, would look like that. Below average in both, decoding and comprehension. Just like a kid in your classroom who's a mixed reader. The hyperlexic reader is a little different. They would be good at decoding, but they would be very poor at language comprehension, so much so that you can see there's about a standard, standard deviation and a half difference. Their decoding is very strong. Their language comprehension is very poor. And if you're a dyslexic reader in Spanish and a native English speaker, you'd have very, very poor decoding and very strong language comprehension, so much so that there's a large gap or a discrepancy between your listening and your decoding. Does that make sense, everybody? So that's what, it, what these readers would look like, and that's what we're looking for. Where are there going to be different kind of profiles? So here were our research questions. I'll answer them quickly. Would U.S. foreign language learners taking Spanish exhibit good or poor Spanish word decoding skills and reading comprehension skills? Would they meet the criteria for the types of foreign language reading disability according to the Simple View model? And would they display variability in their reading profiles? Would there be lots of good readers, lots of dyslexic, lots of hyperlexic, and lots of garden variety? That's what we didn't know. We'd have to find out. So that's what we did. So here's our first week research question. Would US foreign language learners exhibit good or poor word decoding and reading comprehension skills? Now, here are the numbers, standard scores. I'm going to show you on a bell curve because it's much, it's much more interesting to show you that. Here were their word decoding scores, their reading and listening comprehension, and their vocabulary. Now, keep in mind, I could compare your child, who's in ninth grade, to a ninth grade native Spanish speaker if I want to. I can compare them to an eighth grade, a sixth grade, a fifth grade, a first grade. So what I've done here is to show you what US readers look like on average when they're compared to different levels. So watch what happens. We take a ninth grade United States monolingual English speaker who's completed three years of Spanish, three years. If we compare them to ninth grade norms, to ninth grade native Spanish speakers, there's their word decoding, there's their listening comprehension, there's their reading comprehension, and there's their vocabulary. What do they look like compared to a ninth grade native Spanish speaker? You can say it, it's okay. Really awful, really awful. Now, let's compare them to sixth grade native Spanish speaker. Watch what happens. Decoding, listening comprehension, reading comprehension, vocabulary. What skill improved? What didn't move? Everything else. And everything else, comprehension and vocabulary. Now, let's take a ninth grade, uh, I'm sorry, 11th grade now, finishing three years of Spanish and compare them to a third grade native Spanish speaker. Watch what happens. Decoding, comprehension, comprehension, vocabulary. What improved? What didn't improve? Okay. Okay. So let's go to first grade. So now, a student finishing three years of Spanish who's a junior or senior in high school is being compared to a six-year-old native Spanish speaker in first grade. Does that make sense? Here we go. Decoding. Listening comprehension. Reading comprehension. Vocabulary. Okay. 
Does that make sense? ELL teachers, just think. We don't, we, we've got a few studies coming out using these kinds of, of, of models with English language learners. And while the difference isn't that severe between decoding and comprehension, there tends to be a rather large difference between the decoding skills of an English language learner and the comprehension of an English language learner. And the primary, not the only reason, but the primary reason is that last skill that you saw up here, okay? Vocabulary, that's where it's at is they don't have enough English vocabulary. Sense everybody? I was telling someone beforehand, I don't know who I was talking to about doing the testing in Israel. Who, who was that? Someone, yes. I uh, was in Israel, been in Israel three times in the past few years. The last time I was there, last uh, uh, two summers ago, I, was, I, I wanted to do a research study there similar to this, so I want to give native Hebrew speakers, native Arab speakers, English language test, vocabulary, reading, but use the norms to compare them to native English speakers. Does that make sense? So I did a little pilot study. I had a couple of dozen college students who were gonna be EFL teachers, college students in, in Israel. 12 native Hebrew, 12 native Arabic. I gave them some reading tests, but the the, the test that told the answer was the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test. You remember, it's normed on US speakers. The highest score of any of these 24 college students when compared to native English speakers their age was fourth percentile, fourth. That would be, we'll see what that X is for reading comprehension. That's where it would be, right there. And so my colleague, who's the professor there, is just shaking her head, she can't believe it. So she said, my daughter is in the top level of Israeli school, she's a senior, she's gonna be going to college, she won't score that low. So I took it home, we gave it to her daughter. She was right, she didn't score that low, she scored at the eighth percentile, eighth. And this is a top level student. It's the vocabulary that seems to um, be if not the main, the major culprit in hindering language comprehend, listening comprehension and reading comprehension. Does that make sense to everybody the way I've, I've explained it? So English language ELL teachers turn that around, okay, with native Spanish speakers or other language trying to learn English. Okay, second research question. Would U.S. foreign language learners meet criteria for types of foreign language reading disability according to the Simple View model? This was fun. Here are the scores again, but you don't really care about that, okay? Here's what, here's what we found. Here were the types of readers. At the end of year one, remember we had 293 students who finished Spanish one. Here we compared them to ninth grade native Spanish speakers, eighth grade, seventh grade, sixth grade. What was the primary type of reader that almost everyone was? Hyperlexic. Because they could do what? But not comprehend very well. Exactly. It wasn't until we got to first grade taking a kid who is an, a ninth grade United States monolingual English speaker and comparing him to a first grade native Spanish speaker that we got a couple good readers. There were a few garden varieties as you can see, but these were the kids who in Spanish who were having difficulties with decoding as well as comprehension. What happened at the end of second year? Well, there were about 25 students who didn't finish second year who finished first year. Well, what do you see? Pretty much the same thing, right? Pretty much the same thing. We found a few more good readers down here, but not many. And then Spanish three, remember we only had 51 who finished Spanish three. And they're Spanish three. Until we got down to third grade, every single one was hyperlexic. Remember, these were some of your best students. Usually the poorer Spanish students or Spanish learners don't go on to Spanish three. Usually it's the, in most cases, the better learners. 
and we still have most of them. And it wasn't until we got down to first grade that you can see that we had lots of good readers, but they're being compared to kids who are six years of age. So the hyperlexic reader, which was the main profile, let's go back to what we showed you before. Most of the kids look like this, good decoding, and very poor language comprehension. Notice the huge gap between how well they learn to decode Spanish and how well they learn to comprehend Spanish. Any questions on, on that? I see lots of people going like this, so I assume I'm hitting a nerve somewhere with some of you. Third one, would United States foreign language learners display variability in their reading profiles that are proposed by the SVR model? The answer was no. Most of them were hyperlexic. Uh, there's a few, good, a few garden variety. So most of them had good decoding and poor comprehension. So a few had poor decoding and poor comprehension. And we didn't really have any good foreign language learners until we compared to first grade. Real quickly, let me go back. What type of reader did we not have any of? Dyslexic. No dyslexic readers, none. We've never found, in all of our studies over 30 years, we've never found a US foreign language, monolingual English speaker is taking a second language who could be classified as dyslexic unless, unless he was immersed in language when he was three or four or two, maybe grew up with one parent doing this, one parent doing this, and we found a couple, three, a very small handful of, of kids who have done that. Okay. okay, hang on a second here. So most were hyper, hyperlexic. So what are the implications? Now again, I've got a, for ELL teachers, I think the implications are similar, not quite the same, okay, but similar to what you're dealing with. Just like in first language, L1 reading research that we covered earlier, the model provides a very coherent explanation for foreign language reading for English language learners, um, uh, young English language learners in an alphabetic writing system. The foreign language reading comprehension was dependent on both decoding and language comprehension. For those of you interested in, in statistics and correlations, is I, didn't, I, I skipped this table and I went over it, but if you're interested in this, the, the correlation between reading comprehension and listening comprehension by the end of the third year was about 0.78. It increased a little bit each year, 0.78. Now whether we would get, if we went to a fourth year, whether we'd get a higher correlation, I don't know. But it started off in the 0.3s, it went up to the 0.5s, and by, by third year it was 0.78. Listening comprehension was predicting reading comprehension uh, quite well. Not perfectly, but, but, but quite well. Word decoding and language comprehension made separate interdependent contributions to reading skill. And of course, as I just said, they're strongly correlated over time. So. Here's the question, see if you can answer it. How many US students have a foreign language reading, and notice I've used disability in quotes, how many have US students in high school have a foreign language reading disability? The answer has three letters. All, All. every single one, okay? Which brings into question, okay, I've published a lot on this and I'll just mention it. There's uh, been going around now for about 20 years this concept that there's a foreign language learning disability. You heard of that before? No, there's not. No, there's not. And if there is, who has one? Everybody. Every monolingual native English speaker. Everyone. So using the model, all US students have a foreign language reading, quote, disability. Hang on one second, okay? Okay, let's stop here real quickly. Go ahead and can you, uh, somebody wants to ask a question in the back and then we'll, we'll sum up and wrap up. You okay? One time? Okay. I'll just give you mine in a moment. Thank you. Did, uh, thanks. Uh, did, so in your sample, was there anyone uh, who was L1 US but uh, also had full immersion in the foreign language? No. So let's say military base. And if not, no. 
would that be a future direction because these kids all of them have like 40 minutes a day as opposed to full immersion? You got it. That's exactly right. Well, here, here's the only thing I can tell you. No, this was, this was not on a military base or anything like that. It was a, a typical suburban school district in a Midwest city, okay, as, 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 as uh, monolingual as you can get, okay? Um, but if you look at studies from students who have had immersion in elementary school, like say K to six, K to five, what they do with those, you may be familiar with this, is they do these um, criterion reference tests, uh, they call them proficiency tests, with the actful guidelines, right, and the OPIs. And what we, what we're, what, if when you look at that research, they don't do standardized tests, but if you look at that research, it's suggesting something similar here. They learn to decode and spell English, or I'm sorry, the foreign language pretty well, if it's an alphabetic. But their comprehension is not very good. Their language comprehension, the reading comprehension is not very good. Uh, the problem is, is no one's gone in with a standardized test like this. They use these OPI ratings, which are not, I mean, they're okay. What we have, and we haven't even gotten to this, we have so much data on this, we haven't even gotten to this yet. Every student here was given an OPI. It's an oral proficiency interview. So are you, are you native Spanish or native, native, oh, not, okay. Okay, so let's say that, I'm a, that I say I'm a, a Spanish professor, native, native Spanish or not. An oral proficiency interview, proficiency interview is like this. You come walking into a room, we're by ourselves. And I come in and I explain to you that we're gonna have a conversation in Spanish and I'm gonna speak in nothing but Spanish, okay? And I can't do that, so we're gonna do it in English. <laughs> so I start off and I say, what's your name? My name's Christine. My name's Christine, hello Christine, how are you? And, you're I'm doing well. and, and she's supposed to answer nothing but Spanish, okay? And then I take the interview up and up and make it harder and make it harder and make it harder. And we take Christine to the point where that's it, she can't go anymore. And then to make her feel good at the end of the interview, I bring her back down, okay? Okay, and ask her like things like, how old are you? And you can do that, right? That's an oral proficiency interview. Now, every one of these students got that. What we're going to do, and we haven't started it yet, is we're going to take those scores on the oral proficiency interview and uh, put them together with their Spanish vocabulary, Spanish listening comprehension on the Woodcock Munoz, and get an idea of what age level they would be at. So we don't know yet, we'll find out, we'll find out. It's gonna be interesting. Um, so that's a good question, very good question. Somebody else here. It's okay if you say no, but I'm wondering <laughs> if you have any hunches about how it applies to um, our ENL students who come to us from a non-alphabetic language, and if you have any hunches about the implications of phonics instruction for that group. Okay. Here would be my, oh. Did you ever hear a question? Here would be my hunch, and I know just a little bit about it because I spoke uh, with a group of people at a conference for a week in Hong Kong last summer. And of course, uh, Chinese students are learning English. And what they're finding is in the comprehension aspect, uh, it's the same. They have to learn vocabulary, they have to learn the grammar, et cetera, and that plays um, uh, that plays a very large part of how well they learn to comprehend English, whether they're reading or listening. In the decoding piece, one of the things that they're, they're finding is that Chinese students can learn to decode English just fine if, they, if they're taught well. But as you might suspect, it's harder to do because they don't have an alphabetic, alphabetic language. And even by, there were a few deans there from some of the universities and even some of those college students coming into those universities were still having trouble with the decoding of the multisyllabic words. But even if they could decode the multisyllabic words, what was hindering their progress was the academic language, knowing the meaning of it. So that's, that's about the extent of my knowledge in alphabetic languages. I learned a lot over there, but, but that's not my specialty. So I don't know if that helps or not. Anyone else that you have a, go oh, right there. What implications would this have on um, how New York State is looking at the multiple pathways for graduation? 
specifically students with IEPs taking a language, yeah. especially if they have the coding deficiencies, which it seems to be that you test or teach more often in those classrooms. Yeah. Um, lots of implications. How's that? <laughs> Did I get out of that okay? <laughs> lots of implications. Um, here, I have to be careful because I write a lot about this and it's, I have to be careful what I write in journals and what I say. The, 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 the primary problem is, in my view, is going to be what's going to be the standard for passing because you can see what happens right here. I mean, what's going to be the standard for passing? If you have a, and I'm assuming you're talking about monolingual English students, right, speakers, I'm sorry, taking a foreign language, whether it's Spanish or French or whatever, you can see what happens here. And with students with poor language skills, special education or otherwise, it's going to be incredibly difficult. So what's going to be the standard for passing is, is my question. Uh, that would be, to me, that would be the primary implication. Um, there are lots of other implications, which I really won't say out loud, but I can talk to you personally or privately about those. But anyone else on, on this, this research? So, our is very monolingual all the way through. What would, what would happen if you did the same thing with another country that you know two languages as a rule? Here's, I, there's some, um, some work being done by Esther uh, Giva in uh, Toronto. And I've looked at some of her things. And what's different in her work, in Canada, you've got, in Toronto, for example, you've got lots of different languages, of, of, of foreign languages. But when they go to school, unless they're in Quebec, it's all English. There's no, there's, they're not teaching them in Farsi or whatever. Some of her studies, she's got lots of graduate students who are doing dissertations. And then she's published some work on her own. What they're finding is they learn, if taught well, they learn to decode the, the English language. Some struggle, sure. But their vocabulary levels are a little bit higher. And uh, English vocabulary is a little bit higher. In fact, a lot higher in some cases, but still in the uh, below average, below average range. Standard scores of 80, 85, tenths of 15th percentile. And they're speculating uh, that the reason is that they're operating in, yes, that their family might be still speaking the foreign language, whatever the native language, but when they go out the door, there's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of English. When they go to school, it's mostly, if not all, English. Uh, lots of peers are speaking English, so they're exposed to lots of English at a very young, young age, which would enhance your vocabulary, your background knowledge, and all of the things that go into listening, listening comprehension. So you see a similar, similar kinds of, of, of skills but from what I've seen in her studies, the vocabulary skills, even though they're still low, are um, higher than the ones that you see here. Is, is that which, kind of what you're, what you're asking? It's, you know, the implication would kind of be that it's important to be exposed to as much of the language that you're trying to, to learn or to read as much as you possibly can. So, anything, anything else on this? Okay. I'm just curious, with the findings on U.S. students, is there anything surprising about that? Not really. Not really. If, you were, if you're honest and remember yourself when you were taking Spanish or French or German in high school, it was kind of the same thing, wasn't it? It's kind of the same thing. I was really smart and I took Latin. Guess what? You had to speak it or comprehend it. You just had to read and write it. And unfortunately, they only had three years of Latin in high school, so I had to take one year of Spanish. Well, that was a no-go from the beginning, because I had to speak it and, and comprehend it. Okay, summary, wrap-up. Let's just talk about some of the things that we've, we've covered tonight, and then we can open it up, and any questions that you, that you have, or Maria, if you want to direct any kind of questions, we can do that. 
So let's take a look at some of the high points, some of the things that we talked about with the SVR model. The first thing is the formula. D times C equals R. Decoding times comprehension equals reading. Decoding is necessary, but not sufficient. Listening comprehension is necessary, but it's not sufficient for reading. The SVR, one of the other implications, is that it's useful for the assessment of reading skills. It identifies subtypes, the four subtypes of good and poor readers. And there are the four good, the four types of, of readers. It's useful for planning instruction for poor readers. It directs you to the areas where they need targeted instruction. It also points out that the reading skill is not going to improve, or the weak reading skill is not going to improve unless the weak skill is, is remediated. One of the things, and you probably run into this too, but when I travel around the country teaching letters, one of the things that I point out to teachers, and it's kind of common sense, is that lots of students who are poor readers get accommodations. And so if they have a decoding difficulty, then something is read to them. And that's their accommodation. Well, that may be fine for whatever you're doing it for, but it doesn't improve their decoding skills. Or uh, another example, uh, spelling, which um, is a large phonological component to that. And so I'll have teachers ask, is a good accommodation for spelling giving them a multiple choice spelling test? You have a word, you spell it four different ways, can you pick the right one? The answer is no. It may be a combination that you're using to give them a grade, but it's not going to improve, improve their spelling. The SVR is pretty clear that the weak skill is not going to improve unless we target that skill. Oh, I'm sorry. And the simple view may not be quite as simplistic, especially in the area or in the component of comprehension. That it may need to be expanded to accommodate all of these different subcomponents of listening and, and language comprehension. It's also applicable to other alphabetic orthographies, to Spanish or French or German, Latin, Italian, all sorts of things that we referenced earlier. And it explains the reading skills of US foreign language, foreign language learners. Uh, one of the things that is, I'll just say one more thing about that, one of the things that is um, very popular in foreign language right now are foreign language waivers and substitutions for students who um, struggle in the language. And the only way in most cases, I won't say this is true for every school and every college, but in the ones that we've looked at, and we've looked at them pretty extensively, the only way to get that waiver or that substitution is you have to have a diagnosis of learning disability in your first language. And in most, play, in most cases, you can't get that waiver or substitution until you have that, that, that diagnosis of LD in your first language. So what has happened is that LD diagnosis for students who rightly or wrongly want a waiver or substitution, that LD diagnosis has become like gold because they can't get that, that waiver until they have that, that diagnosis. So we encounter this, this um, quite a bit, quite a bit. Okay, well thank you very much, I appreciate it. Thanks very much, thanks for your attention.